right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Chicago, which I guess is probably a little chillier today by Blair Seeger. How are you doing, Blair? Good. How are you, John? Thanks for having me. Yeah, so not too cold, I hope. It's actually in the 70s now. I think the eclipse, I don't know. I'm I'm putting everything on the eclipse. On the eclipse. I'm really <laughs> believing in it now. But yeah, it's 70 and gorgeous out. I actually have the windows open. Oh, fantastic. And Blair is the founder and CEO of Quantisco, uh, a negotiation intelligence platform for B2B sales teams. Imagine a platform where you can understand the true impact of your discounts and concessions and how effective they have been during negotiations. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about today. And Blair spent almost nine years at Meta, formerly face, uh, Facebook, Instagram, where you worked across sales, marketing and product. So, um, Blair, what made you, let's just kind of baseline this a little bit, like what made, what made you decide that there was a gap in the market for technology around negotiations? And what have you learned to even during your time at, at Met and stuff that showed you how negotiations are something that, to be honest, tends to be kind of organic to an organization. They do it this way because somebody used to do it that way and everybody just follows along behind. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, really... When I was at Meta, how how it really impacted or how it grew from my role there is there was always a value exchange because we are really focused on product adoption at the time, at least on mm -hmm. product adoption and helping the clients um, increase their investment with our products. It was really about the value exchange. So what can I get you that is going to be mutually beneficial in this in this partnership? Mm -hmm. um, so really, really about that value exchange, which I believe is the core to successful negotiations. And so while I was there, I, I got to be I, I was more exposed on that end. Um, but it's very different than what we're really building now, um, which is for B2B enterprise sellers, sell, sales organizations. And so how this really started was um, my brother, who works in enterprise sales, he we would just be talking about his day and what deals he's closing, you know, talk and shop. And something he kept bringing up was around discounts, mm -hmm. um, multiple. And even when I talk about it now, uh, when I say it, sellers always have that kind of reaction um, th that you just had, which is it's always there, whether it's approvals are taking too long. We're not, we don't know the right discount to provide or what to ask in return, like what a referral or testimonial is worth to our company in exchange for what. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, but the CPQ tools today, there was a lot, there's a lot being built around CPQ. So we know there's something there. Um, we know that there is money being left on the table. And so, you know, the goal is to really help improve negotiations by by making that data um, visible. Yeah, and what's really interesting about that is uh, is what you were saying is is that generally speaking, discounting it tends to be very deal specific. So it tends to be you know, and we don't tend to go back and look at you know, oh, I gave twenty percent there, but I only get fifteen over here, and then. Oh, yeah, but then with the 15%, I threw in a bunch of freebies and stuff. So it's really 30% or whatever it is. But we look at it all as we look at it kind of deal specific and then we kind of conveniently move on from there. What you're yeah. saying is there's actually real hard intelligence to be gained by looking at the discounting and the, and the, the discounting data. Absolutely. Just, just being able to see what a successful quote looks like in terms of different SKU adoption, mm -hmm. customer success, LTV, NRR. If you're able to see, you know, what your deal looked like from your best customer um, and able to replicate that deal towards customers that look just like them. Mm -hmm. Think about, you know, that, that in my opinion is, is really using that machine learning and AI to, to optimize the, the deal workflow in terms of negotiations as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because like, uh, like I said, is oftentimes, uh, yeah, most companies might have a, a policy around, you know, discounting and stuff. But the reality is, the policy is only, it's on paper, but it kind of tends to get, uh, it tends to get modified, shall we say, 
uh, you know, case by case. And it's always, there's always a reason why we need to kind of go outside of the, of the standard, uh, of the standard policy, because we can always come up with great reasons why we need to do that. And so in the end, it almost seems like redundant to have a policy at all, because it's really a range, not a policy. Exactly. And really, I think uh, there's a lot that kind of got us here, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think most companies are starting to think about how to course correct that, how to course correct the pricing strategy and the process they have I'm sorry, and the process that they have in place. So a CPQ is only going to be so successful if those if those pol those processes are implemented the right way, and those pricing strategies are are um, implemented the right way to the teams. Yeah, and as you said, I mean, you need to be able to do a deep dive into the data because you don't know what you don't know, right? So I mean, and again, you don't know. I mean, you'll learn later on how profitable your business is, but uh, but oftentimes when everything is just focused on revenue generation and closing business, we don't think too much about the bottom line implications of it. And if you're discounting, if you're throwing in freebies, if you're doing all of this stuff, you know, you you are eroding your margin bit by bit, and maybe to a point where you suddenly, at the end of it, discover actually that was uh, a net loss. Exactly. And it's it's if it's even interesting now talking to customers and understanding how they track that information, mm -hmm. if they track it. And likely yeah. they don't. And it could be sitting in a in an OPEX, you know, an OPEX uh, uh warehouse, so to speak, data yeah. warehouse, so to speak. Um, but for whatever reason, it's they're having trouble visualizing that data and getting it on a on a daily basis, even. Um, so if they can't get that for sales managers. How are they supposed to help their reps? I mean, we have all of these amazing tools now that AI has really pushed forward, but negotiation, I would say takes up between 50 to 60% of the entire sales cycle, deal cycle. So if that's not being optimized, we're, we're absolutely leaving that money on the table and we're not getting that value exchange between ourselves and the customer to make it a, a true true beneficial mutually beneficial partnership so what are some of the what are some of the uh, the results um, not the results so much as like the outcomes that some of your customers are starting to see now using this yeah i think overall we're seeing a 3 to we're uncovering 3 to 4% of margin so we're we're un uncovering costs that can improve margin up to 3 to 4% just by showing the revenue conceded via discounts or concessions mm -hmm. so again really getting into that the opportunity level yeah and and what's really significant about that is um we used to talk about this a lot in presentations but you know the number one destroyer of homes in the US you know most people would say fire and if it's not fire, they would say, you know, wind. Um, well, the reality, it's not. It's termites. Uh, and the thing about termites is, you know, as we know, is termites are there for years and years and years. You don't even notice them. And then one day your house falls down. It's what you're just talking about, that three, per, three to four percent is those are like termites. You don't even notice how much you're giving away over time until it comes back to bite you. Maybe you lose a couple of customers or something and suddenly margin is critically important and you realize that your cost base outweighs your revenue. And, and these, little, these little percentages have been eating away at your liquidity. Shavings equal a pile. I mean, mm -hmm. it's that that has been the, you know, and it really did start with my brother who at that time really focusing on the sales rep. And we have pivoted a bit um, mm -hmm. because we saw that it, it can serve many needs. Um, but focusing on the sales rep, we we it's a shavings equal a pile. If the, he's discounting or shooting off the hip, it adds up. And that adds up to take out of his, that's taken out of his commission check. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really, it's really impacting every, every person touching the revenue at the company. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's it. And I think that's the always has been the issue is that you have that division between salespeople who are very obviously top line focused. And then you have the a lot of these, the rest of the organization that's supporting them who are, you know, cost centers and therefore impacting the bottom line. And if there's not some kind of 
uh, if there's not good synergy and synchronization between the two of them, you can actually, they can be almost working at, at, at uh, odds with each other. Exactly. And I think something I did want to mention, because I do want to call out Pipeliner as well, when you um, when you guys were in Chicago and we had these great discussions around that visibility piece and those visualizations. I think in the beginning, when we first started building, I mentioned CPQ, we thought we just needed to make a new CPQ tool. Mm -hmm. So we're showing off this prototype to folks and all that, every single person that we, we talked to kept their eyes widened at the same thing, which were the visualizations, mm -hmm. the logic that got us there. So we scaled, we, we pivot, not pivoted, I should say, we scaled back and said, okay, what if we just, what if we just really make the visualizations as clear as possible, give mm -hmm. them a little nudge. And then if that's working, if they find value for, from that, let us know what you want to automate next. And so now instead of us, you know, starting out with a, with an idea that we think we know, we're really putting it in the market's hands of telling us, you know, what do you want to see next? And, and picking up on those patterns and figuring out how to automate them. So that's been, that's been the next uh, fun part about this is really thinking about how we can disrupt that process and, and getting those insights into how. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, the, the visualization, yeah, that's so uh, incredibly important because sometimes people are, I mean, number one, they believe what they see normally, but also oftentimes they've never seen it before. You know, yes, the data may be there, but it may be in spreadsheet format. It may be in some, you know, in percentages or whatever, stuff that a lot of people, particularly in, in sales and management, don't always relate to because they just want things netted. They want to be able to see it. So the more you can visualize uh, this, then then the light bulb goes off. Uh, you know, the the poor accountant may love pouring over numbers and percentages, but generally speaking, nobody else does. Exactly. And we talked about it too, when you were in Chicago, just about mm -hmm. the need to, with all of these amazing tools, like I mentioned before, mm -hmm. coming out, we have a huge opportunity to make sales organizations even more analytical yep. and to, to build it in a way that really makes sense for them, not necessarily building it from a data scientist perspective or product perspective, but having that seller's point of view to make sure that it can be applied and easy for them to understand and action on. Yeah. And, and that's not to, and that's not to downplay, you know, experience and, you know, gut feeling and stuff. Cause I actually believe that all still plays a role. However, it's much better if you have a gut feeling about something and then you can look at it and you can confirm that you were correct than just going on your gut. So I think absolutely um, for for salespeople, from anybody in revenue generating positions, like having access uh, to visual data now is more critical than ever just because it just means that you can confirm and validate what you think. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's been a really, I think the the new founder journey has been an absolute vast blast. And um, re, really starting with this network and, and meeting folks like yourself to learn really what those hair on fire problems are and digging deep and then figuring out a really simple way to, to approach it and let them determine what's next. It's been fun. Yeah, and and about your journey, I mean, it's an in, yeah, it's an interesting one because you know they uh, you've already mentioned that you know you started this and you've even like pivoted slightly or whatever, but you've reacted. Uh, and tell me about the how important has it been that you your intellectual curiosity, your flexibility, your your uh, you know your ability to actually like go and check and validate and sort of second guess yourself if you like because uh because it's great to have you need to have conviction and belief in what you're doing but you also need to be open to you know what you're discovering and to to be able to you know modify if necessary so what has that journey been like for you it's funny because initially it was almost like well if my if my brother has this problem surely everybody has the same uh -huh. problem and that was true to an extent, but everybody has very, especially with enterprise sales orgs, has very, very different nuances to those problems mm -hmm. and how they, how they distinguish the problem versus the symptom of the problem. So I think 
it took me a little while to marry the problem versus marry the solution. I feel like I was married to the solution initially and over time just asking better talking and asking better questions has shifted it to be like no I, i'm married to this problem married to figuring it out solving for it so it's absolutely just just asking better questions talking to more people yeah and it's and, and what you just outlined there i mean it's actually just getting in tune with the business needs of of your your target audience and showing having the intellectual curiosity to want to learn about their business about the business of business you know which is in critical i mean in your in what you're doing now understanding the business of business and that's something that you know traditionally quite frankly you know some people in the sales arena have not really had that much interest in the business of business or even in the really the business of their client they're more into i had a guy who worked for me once who used to say you know john I sell the sizzle, not the steak, okay? And I used to go, yeah, that sounds great and everything, but what happens when they want to know about the steak, you know? And he's like, was, but do you know what I mean? It's like you have to, nowadays, I don't think you can, get a, you can get away with just trying to sell the sizzle anymore. At the end of the day, it's still people to people, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything starts with a relationship. And I think that's where I've had the most fun in this journey and why going back to just that, that point around insatiable curiosity, mm -hmm. just the relationships you build, what you get to learn from people, hearing their perspective. When you go into it with that, again, you, people buy from people. Sure. It's just the weight of it also takes off a little bit. It, it's a little less intimidating, a little less pressure. You're just making relationships with people and understanding, just being curious about them at the end of the day and, and what's keeping them up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think that's such a key point. I mean, it's not it, not to underestimate at all. I think it's a very key point. Uh, people appreciate when you show a genuine interest. I mean, it has to be a genuine interest. But when you're genuinely interested in understanding their situation, and it's not just their situation from, you know, they may be a B2B buyer, they may be part of a buying committee, whatever it is. So yes, the reasons why they're doing it and the company's doing it, but also what if they, what's invested personally on their behalf? Because as you said, again, at the end of the day, buyers are people, sellers are people. There's a certain personal investment in everything we do and uncovering that or making it comfortable for the other person to be able to express that, then you start to build that trust relationship. Exactly. It, it really does go back to negotiations, mm -hmm. which is not a negotiation. It's a value exchange. What yeah. can, at the end of the day, what, what are we able to provide to each other where this is, and I hate even saying it so technically, I guess like that, but what are we, what are we going to provide to one another that really makes this a strong, mutually beneficial uh, mm -hmm. partnership or relationship? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's the that's key that uh, we get we get back to the concept of the best outcomes is when everybody wins together, right? I mean, you don't nobody wins totally because that's unrealistic. Um, or as uh, as Nicholas, who you met, you know, the CEO, founder of Pipeliner, likes to say, a good deal is one that hurts each party a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's abs. It's so true. And again, that that exchange, you know, it's uh, it's it's really it comes down to meeting people right where they are and truly yeah. understanding what they what they need what they need to get out of it, and also you. Yeah. And I guess one of the things that you've probably discovered now as you've gone out with your product and talked to people is that negotiations is is a very uh, overlooked area. It's one that's very rarely trained for. It's very, most people end up, I mean, a lot of salespeople end up doing lots and lots of big, big negotiations without ever, ever having had any any training or guidance on how to do it so um and especially now with tools and tools like yours coming out i i feel like this is this is a frontier that's finally getting addressed i absolutely and especially you know given the economy how, how yeah. companies are transitioning and really moving from growth at all costs to grow efficiently it's mm. more important than ever um and you know like we talked about a third of the workforce is sellers. So there's a huge opportunity to, to really impact top line growth, um, both at an individual level and a wealth perspective for those individuals, as well as you know company, company top line revenue.
Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, and if you are, you know, uh, if you either have to pivot now to being on a path to profitability, which is their nice new buzzword, which to my mind, if you're not on a path to profitability in the first place, I don't know what you're doing in business, to be honest. That's my opinion. But uh, but ab absolutely, if you think about it, when the focus is more now on the uh, it's a tough economy on on greater efficiencies and on looking at the bottom line, those those three or four percentage points that you're giving away in every negotiation could actually be the difference between your company surviving or thriving. Exactly, exactly, and that's why we're doing what we're doing, and I I'm very excited. Excellent. Well, all of Blair's information will be below this video. But before we go, Blair, do tell people a little bit more about you and Quant Disco. I'm Blair Siegler. I'm the CEO and founder of Quant Disco, which is a new negotiation intelligence platform so you can truly understand the impact of your concessions and discounts and what to change about that. Fantastic. Well, I encourage you to go check it out. As I said, just remember, if you remember nothing else, remember it's not fire or wind, it's termites. Termites is what we get you go. at the end of the day. The silent killers and those every extra little percentage point you give away or every freebie you throw in or every extra resource you bring into something, just remember them as a termite. Termites, I love it. Should have ended with that. Thank you so much, John. All right, thanks, Blair. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.